I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the Supreme Court case from 1971, Richardson v. Perales, which is about on the record adjudicatory process or hearings and the hearsay rule. Now, for my students, keep in mind, here we're talking about formal adjudication under the Administrative Procedure Act, and that's because it was on the statute required on the record determinations. So this is a little different than say Goldberg v. Kelly or um, the Loudermill case where we were talking about informal quick check hearings. The social security hearings usually have an administrative law judge. So let's go to the case and see what happens. The case is famous mostly for its holding that the hearsay rules do not apply in administrative hearings. In other words, hearsay is admissible. If you don't get anything else out of this case, it's that hearsay is okay in administrative hearings or adjudications. This applies even in formal agency adjudication, which otherwise may resemble something like a bench trial. So uh, in when I did social security disability hearings, we would have an administrative law judge who would wear a judge's robe and they would sit at a, on the bench, like, at a, um, uh, like in a regular small hearing room or trial room. And there were parties, uh, tables for the parties to sit at there. Was, and there's a court reporter, they go on the record, they go off the record and so forth. So it feels very trial-like, but it is not an article three trial, right? And court trial. And so hearsay is admissible. Keep in mind, this is another social security disability case. And the hearsay in question in this case uh, that we're talking about is medical examination reports. So here's the facts of the case, so just in a nutshell. And by the way, when you read this case as a student, it gets very confusing because there's so many different doctors that are mentioned and so many different diagnoses that are all very similar. But the bottom line is Mr. Perales injured his back at work. And the first doctor he visited thought his injury was mild but not disabling and recommended maybe getting surgery. His pain persisted and so he had the surgery. Unfortunately, his pain continued even came back even after his back surgery. So eventually he went to another doctor who said that his injury actually was severe enough to be disabling. So he applied for social security disability benefits. Remember that to qualify for this, you have to be permanently disabled or disabled for more than a year, unable to work. And the um, eligibility requirements are rather rigorous. The agency, the Social Security Administra Administration, referred the case to its state counterpart, Disability Determination Services, like they always do, for the initial disability determination. And that agency, in turn, sent him to other doctors and specialists, basically for second and third and fourth and fifth opinions um, for exams. Uh, sometimes these are called medical examiners or medical experts, MEs for short, um, kind of in the trade or uh, for those who do these types of cases. The court um, just calls them examiners or the medical examiners or the doctors. Um, so the five outside doctors and psychiatrists that the SSA and DDS hired to examine our claimant here submitted unfavorable reports, uh, unsworn testimony, at least from the standpoint of establishing disability under the Social Security Administration regulations. In other words, they, uh, they thought uh, it, they varied in thinking he had some mild problems to that he was kind of faking it, or the technical term is malingering, um, pretending to be sick to get out of work. Um, Pirelles, when he went to a hearing, wanted to cross-examine these doctors um, in front of the ALJ and was mad that the ALJ hadn't um, subpoenaed them uh, to testify and authenticate their medical reports. But he was denied the opportunity to do this. Of course, he didn't ask the, administ the administration to subpoena uh, these witnesses, and we don't. the court makes kind of a big deal out of that in the opinion. Also at the hearing, another doctor um, 
who had never examined uh, Mr. Pirelles also testified. By the way, this all is standard operating procedure for the Social Secu Security Administration in its disability cases. If you apply for disability, they're going to get your own treating physician's medical records <coughs> and then um, send you to one or more um, doctors that they have contracted with to get a second opinion. And they may have a sort of medical expert who's often a, um, a, an older, like elder statesman in the medical community uh, locally um, testify at the hearing who gives an opinion based just on reading the medical reports from the petitioner or claimant's uh, medical files and the reports submitted by the um, outside experts that uh, DDS picked. Perales' own doctor also testified at the hearing and claimed that he was disabled. The court calls the um, adjudicator, the hearing examiner, in modern times we would call this person an administrative law judge, and he found he was not disabled based on the medical reports from the doctors. The court here notes that this claimant had more tests and exams than most people and that the reports were mostly consistent and that he failed to subpoena any of the contested doctors to the hearing and that the agency's cost would skyrocket if they had to produce live testimony from every medical um, examiner or expert in every case. Now, for those of you, again, who want to kind of zero in on what do I highlight in this case or what's the big takeaway, the Supreme Court allowed written medical reports to be admitted and given controlling weight in Social Security disability hearings, despite the fact that they might have been excluded as hearsay evidence in a regular court. Also, there was... They, don't have to give them a presumption of bias, even though these doctors were hired or paid by the Social Security Administration through the state DDS office. And in general, hearsay rules and other evidentiary prohibitions are relaxed in administrative adjudications. Okay, um, what about the residual rule? The court doesn't really talk about this, but this is an, um, an aspect of this area of law that you, I just want to mention for you in passing. This was a traditional common law rule or requirement um, before this case that an administrative record of decision must contain at least a residuum of non-hearsay support for the agency's decision or else the court would reverse the decision under the substantial evidence test, which we will get to later in this in the course, but just keep in mind, essentially, we had this older common law rule that if hearsay was admissible, but the final conclusion must be based on at least some non-hearsay evidence, even if it does give some weight to the hearsay. And that was the residuum rule. Here, the Supreme Court effectively eliminated the residuum rule in the federal system, but keep in mind, it applies in some state courts. Also, a quick note about hearings, administrative law judges actually have a lot of discretion under um, APA Section 556 about how to run their hearings. And a party's right to bring non-lawyers to the hearing is really subject to the ALJ's permission. Okay, here's a quick review question to see if you've been paying attention. Um, does the traditional rule against hearsay evidence apply in administrative hearings and tribu tribunals? Yes or no? Hopefully, you know the answer to this. This was supposed to be an easy question. If you're not sure, you really should go back and rewatch this video. And that concludes our lecture about Richardson v. Perales.